You are listening to the Prepared Warrior Podcast, where law enforcement and military trainers discuss cutting-edge training, tactics, and technology. Here is your host, John Wilson. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 5 of the Prepared Warrior. I'm John Wilson. Our guest for this episode is Spiro Dimitriadi. I like to start every episode with a quote. This one comes from an author unknown who said, Advanced techniques are the basics mastered. Time to welcome our special guest to the program. Spiro Dimitriadi is a business leader, consultant, and entrepreneur with over 25 years experience creating, marketing, and selling tactical training courses, services, and high technology products to U.S. law enforcement agencies and the U.S. Armed Forces. Spiro is an expert in night vision, thermal, and laser technologies as it relates to close quarter battle and operations for those who he fondly calls door kickers. The Military Law Enforcement Combatives Senior Advisor for Gracie University, Spiro is the former outdoor group publisher for Engaged Media, publishing magazine titles such as American Survival Guide, World of Firepower, Gun World, Tactical World, Home Defenders, and Concealed Carry Handguns. Spiro is an Army Infantry Veteran, Airborne Qualified, and a Financial Services Professional focusing on helping law enforcement, military, and those in the defense industry. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. It sounds like you're quite busy, and you always have a lot on your plate, it seems. <laughs> yes, Jonathan, uh, it is a lot on my plate, but it all has to do or focuses on one area about protection, whether it's protecting life or limb, uh, your partners, or even your money at that point in family. So uh, it is a lot, but it is a common theme of protection. So for today's uh, show, I, we were going to delve into um, one of your specific areas of expertise, which is uh, thermal, night vision, uh, and kind of low light, no light um, training. So first, I guess, how did you get into uh, night vision? Um, it begins really being with the Gracie Academy, uh, now Gracie University, 25 years ago, where back in middle 90s, Hori on Gracie, I was still a prominent businessman back then. He said, hey, Spiro, you're good at business. And uh, he was on top of me, mounted, uh, doing jujitsu. And he said, Spiro, do you want to take over uh, our military and law enforcement uh, training program? So since Hardy on Gracie was on top of me and his hands were around my neck, of course, I had to say yes. So anyway, long story short, that began... Um, and I'm still involved with the Gracies, but not as heavily as I was for the past 20 years, providing combatives training to military and law enforcement, and then eventually got into a lot of gear and weaponry. So to answer specifically your question, around 15 years ago, I really got into the night vision, though I was exposed to that like 30 years ago when I was in the military. But today's modern type technology, you know, 15 years ago, I was ex um, uh, shown some night vision again. I loved it. And then I got into the sales. So then from there, I ended up um, back in 2010, after being exposed to night vision for a number of years then, I ended up taking over Moro Vision, which is no longer around a company where I took over the sales and marketing for the company and sold, you know, with my team, uh, like a hundred million dollars worth of gear. Wow. So. Night vision, you, people think of it probably as something very high tech, but not a lot has changed from the, the basic technology of it. Is that right? I'm not going to get into the engineer high tech part because first of all, that's not my wheelhouse, uh, mm -hmm. but but I think what you're trying to say, Jonathan, is that night vision today, most of it is analog. If I, right, if I yeah. could um, maybe compare it to vinyl records, that warm mm -hmm. vinyl sound compared to digital today. So the answer is yes, in that sense, that uh, the analog night vision hasn't changed and still even our most advanced night vision, Jonathan, has what we call image tubes. And the reason why we have not gone to digital 
at this point is for a couple reasons. Uh, when you look through a night vision that has an image tube, in essence, you're looking through an optic that is, has not been converted to anything digitally. So what you're doing is when you're looking through night vision through an image tube, you're looking at something real time. So if I'm looking through night vision and you wave your hand, it's instantly what I see as if I was looking at you with my naked eye. So the challenge with digital, and we, we are going to get there eventually, uh, people are always trying to guess when, uh, no one knows, but my guess I'd say maybe another five to 10 years. The problem with digital is primarily twofold. One is the power consumption. That's the second, but not most important problematic issue that it just takes a lot of power. It just sucks up a lot of power on a device. So the devices already, you could say, are kind of bulky, and now you're going to need more battery power to operate that thing for a reasonable period of time without changing your batteries. So power consumption is a problem with digital. But the more important problem is that it's not real time. So with digital, and I've experienced like $50,000 goggles with a company known, known uh, Intavec, and I would say they're the leaders in that still today, that uh, even 10 years ago, they had an amazing goggles and you could really see almost similarly uh, at night with low light compared to image tubes, uh, people, images, etc., in low light conditions. Uh, you could see the quality, but the problem is it wasn't real time. There was like a few, a, a split second or a certain amount of time that what you see live converts to the digital and then you see it with your eyes. So as you could imagine, if you're kicking in the door, if you have that split, split, split second delay, what you see is not real time, then that could be a life or death situation. So that, that's the main thing. It's not real time yet, the digital. I see. Yeah. And that's uh, so no one's really going to uh, fully uh, switch over to digital until till you can have it real time. Right. Or, right. I, I, yeah. To be more clear, I'm glad you asked that. So I, I would say more of like the, the CQB door kickers because right then and there. But uh, mm -hmm. but I would believe maybe a fighter pilot or those th that split second may not be as critical compared to a CQB scenario. Sure, like a surveillance, uh, surveillance or type mission, or even yeah. dropping some, you know, um, ordinance or something like that. I would say, and I believe they do. Don't quote me on it, but I believe they are using digital night vision. I'm certain uh, fighter pilots are, like the F-35s, etc. Right, and I would imagine they have the space to kind of have the batteries required to and that yes to keep it running and everything. Yeah. So it, so there is some, some use, but yeah, the, the on the ground, uh, close quarters battle, which, which is that, would you say your expertise, uh, more, um, in the low light and no light training? Yes. The, the, I mean, there's many ways to put it, but the body worn type equipment, those are the guys that I care for and love the most. And, um, regularly communicate with whether it's combatives training or, or tactical related training or night vision. Yes, the, the door kickers, CQB, and it could be extended to the snipers as well. So what would you say is the difference between uh, green and black and white night vision? Well, one is green and one is black and white. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Um, I'm glad you asked that. So back in whatever it was, decades ago, 50 years ago or so, even after World War II, when uh, my vision was created, they, they ended up, the engineers, these amazing people who create all these wonderful things that make our world safer, more secure, they, they, when they created night vision, at that point, they were able to choose, Jonathan, various colors of night vision. It wasn't by default that, hey, I, we discovered night vision and it's green, which most people see today in the movies and still a lot of night vision is green. They chose green back then, decades ago, and we've had it since, 
because green was uh, um, the ideal color that allowed to show the difference in shades and color contrast in low light conditions. So that's why they chose green among other colors. As far as I know, it could have been pink for that matter. Uh, so right. then after 9-11, uh, if you could imagine before 9-11, uh, and I'm dating myself when I served in the military before then, we were all training for mass land warfare, kind of like that World War II mentality where thousands of tanks and hundreds of thousands of troops fighting over large um, land theaters of, of war. And then after 9-11, that changed war warfare. Things got up close and personal urban warfare, close quarters battle, all that kind of stuff. So um, the night vision was still, the green was was obviously still there uh, after 9-11. So when our engineers created the green or chose green color, it was more for outdoor type low light conditions, getting to my point. So after the 9-11, we ended up getting in again up close and personal, room clearing, thing, building clearing, etc. The green worked great, but then they found out, the engineers, etc., that in those conditions, unlike starlight and moonlight and being out in, in, in the open skies, that close quarters scenarios, the white, uh, black and white, or what we call white phosphor, uh, was better as far as a contrast. So green, they're all phosphor. So whatever color it is, then you follow it with the word phosphor. Some people mm -hmm. mistakenly, not to get too nitpicking here, call it phosphorus. It's more, it's called phosphor. So green phosphor or white phosphor. So nowadays, more and more, because of more clo close quarters, battle room clearing, etc. The um, uh, we're going towards more use of white phosphor, which is basically black and white. I see. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, what would you say is the difference? Uh, another difference between uh, the uh, monoculars and binoculars? Okay, great. The through all the training I've I've, I've uh, been involved in and. And for me, I've been blessed to just not only train with, but also partner with many great organizations from the Gracies to the tactical training providers, Telerik Group, that I've partnered with in the past based out of Georgia and Florida. So I've learned a lot with them by basically being the class filler up or booking the classes, filling the classes and learning uh, from them. So using that experience uh i having binoculars is far better than having a monocular so the pros and cons for both very briefly is a monocular costs less than a binocular typically a, bin a monocular night vision would run maybe around three thousand us dollars where a binocular would run around 10,000. So don't get, you know, exactly me. I'm giving you ballpark numbers. So right. the pro and, there's a pro and con there, a difference between pricing. So the, po the pro part of a monocular, Jonathan, is that you wear the monocular over your non-firing eye. And in a low light condition, Let's just say I'm a right-handed shooter, right eye dominant. I wear my monocular over my left eye. So it's pretty interesting how the brain just kind of adapts that even though you're, my right eye, your naked eye, doesn't have night vision, your brain kind of figures it out. And you could see at night the green or white phosphor, or whatever color, um, you could see the night vision and you could effectively shoot and and basically operate at night with a monocular. So the, the, the upside on that is also that your naked eye is able to immediately spot any light change in the room. So if you're entering a particular room that's really dark and you've got maybe a, let's just say it's a home, 
and you've got an alarm clock and you know that alarm clock is enough that to basically extract light from the night vision and show to be able to see at night with night vision so you're able, so suddenly if there's some bad guy in there and then the lights go on or or maybe they have a flashlight with the naked eye you're instantly be able to spot that so that's a plus with the monocular but the downside with a monocular is that because you're only using one eye your brain still has to work to kind of figure it out figure it out and you're not as uh, proficient in moving and and walking around and maybe turning on a light switch or grabbing a door handle it just takes a great deal of practice and still it's hard because you're using one eye and you don't have that peripheral vision and situational awareness using one eye through your night vision compared to two does that make sense yeah okay um would you still lose uh, depth perception like would you have more peripheral vision than with uh, binoculars though yeah Without getting too technical, it would feel like you do. <laughs> oh, yeah. It would feel like you do. But it's, if it's a yes or no a answer, I would say yes. But yeah, just okay. more depth perception um, with a binocular. So on the binocular side, at least today's binoculars, they're still selling a lot of fixed binoculars. Fixed, what I mean is that the bridge is just fixed where really it, it came from – helicopter and aircraft pilots um, where it, it is just a binocular. But today's more advanced night vision binoculars allow you to go from monocular, meaning they're both in front of your eyes, you could move yep. one out of the way. So basically today's binoculars, at least most of them what I sell, gives you the option to go monocular or binocular just by moving one of them out of the way or putting one in front. So follow me so far? Okay. Yeah, exactly. So so yeah. for the binocular, the upside is kind of the opposite of what I said with the monocular. You're using both eyes. You're able to move a lot faster. You have more situational, uh, situational awareness, more depth perception. And you're able to grab that doorknob or move around over a pillow or a toy or whatever could be uh, uh, in front of you. Uh, so that's the upside. But the downside with a binocular, but still I would use the binocular, is that it's hard to spot any instant light change that may happen. So, right. so back to the monocular, when you use a monocular – you uh, would use an eye cup, and the eye cup is good because then it it prevents a, a splash, what we call it, from the monocular, the little light. While you're looking, it kind of splashes on, on your face, around your eye. So mm -hmm. uh, when it's really dark or completely dark, it's easy to spot that little light. But when you wear a... Um, the with the monocular when you're wearing the eye cup it covers that and you can't see it so you're completely dark but on the binoculars you cannot wear eye cups because the way night vision is developed through the years that i could be wearing night vision with eye cups in the dark and you could turn on the lights in a way i really may not even know that the light conditions have changed and i'm thinking i'm all dark and stealthy and the bad guy could, could see <laughs> me like clear as day. So that's bad. And therefore, that's why with monoculars, excuse me, binoculars, you would never wear eye cups. So basically, you have your eye cup free. And therefore, the downside is that you do um, have that splash on your uh, face. But you can get certain amber type filters that can reduce that. But nonetheless, the, the splash will still remain a little bit on your face. And as far as detecting, and again, it's all training. I'm big on training, and that's my expertise, providing whatever it is, training to help those um, you know, special operations um, people that I care and love in the field. It's the training. But through training, you're able to learn how to look out the side of your binoculars, left or right side, or, or on the bottom or look up just a little bit to learn how to spot light changes because there is a gap between the binocular 
and your eyes. It's not like slamming up against your eyeball. There is that little yeah. space. So I hope that makes sense or answers the question. Yeah, yeah. There's there's kind of a lot of. Uh, I mean, there's there's little details that you that you need to know that uh, <clears throat> could make a difference in in a lot of different situations. I imagine. So uh, I guess we could go further into like um, you know just. Why is it important to train in low light, you know, no light conditions um, with with those kind of devices? I mean, you've you've already got into some of the the details because I I guess um, if if it's your first time wearing it, you know, you might not be comfortable like looking looking around it or pulling you know one of the binocular eyepieces up or or anything like that. So so why is it important to uh, to get familiar with those gotcha yeah so real back just a little bit one thing to, for me to add yeah it, it, there's yeah. no right or wrong as far as binocular or minoc monocular because it's a choice mm -hmm. but if you have a particular squat team as an example uh it, depending on how they train and what they feel is best it is possible that an entry team maybe one guy or the first person going in operator could have uh Again, they're all wearing binoculars ideally, but one could go in with the monocular mode. One of them is pulled up because they want to be able to instantly spot the light change and then um, verbally give instructions to the uh, the rest of the operators behind them. So I'm saying you, it's not necessarily, I'd say, a default. You should always go binocular mode, but it could also work as a combination. Some operators doing monocular mode, some doing binocular. But anyway, so to answer the question, think about it. I don't have the statistics in front of me, but I but we can say generally bad deeds, uh, dangerous scenarios quite often happen in dark, low light conditions. Even during the middle of the day in a city one could find themselves suddenly going into a building that's very dark, no lights, in an instant. So I believe that for sure special operations units, SWAT teams, um, you know, uh, or whatever you call them, there's different variations, but uh, special operations, law enforcement and military, but let's focus law enforcement. You never know when you're going to find yourself in a very dark condition where you're going to have to continue on your mission and move forward somewhere. So having that particular training is huge if you think about it. Uh, the, other, the only other choice that you have if you don't have night vision, and we can get into it if you want, the, 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 you know, the quad that I call, um, but, but up to most people would have a flashlight in their hand or if they have like a long gun or maybe on their handgun, uh, a flashlight. But either way, in most cases, if you want to operate in the dark and you don't have, you're not set up with night vision type gear or training, then you have a lot white light, usually. So if you use the white light, then, you know, you could spot something or somebody go, you know, in, in the room or, or whatever that scenario is. But obviously the downside is you're giving yourself away. And it's not right. possible to get into this over the phone in detail, but pretty much you could think about it. If you have a flashlight, and I'm a bad guy, and I see a flashlight, and I kind of know that the law enforcement's coming at me. I'm just going to shoot at the light. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of techniques to, you know, move and, and stretch your arm out with the light. So if they do shoot you, worst case, your hand gets shot. Uh, but, done, but nonetheless, <laughs> flashlights can give your position away. But I'm not saying flashlights don't have their place because they do, and that's part of the training. Um, so to answer your question and get into a little more detail, Jonathan, especially for special operations units, and still uh, I would say all the major agencies do have them, and I, I've trained with them before. I did you know, a large SWAT team, at least a classroom-type training back in December in California, et cetera. But the larger agencies usually do have all the gear. So the key gear that every, at least the SWAT team should have would be a helmet, right? The helmet mounted night vision. I'm writing it down right. to make sure I don't miss anything. <laughs> then as far as their long gun, 
they should have the uh, a laser. And remind me to talk about lasers if I forget. Okay. And then on that laser, they should have the um, white light, all with a button. Okay, press button, and a um, and then even be better case like a, a red dot sight. So a, so helmet mounted night vision, the long gun with a, a white light, um, laser and red dot sight. So when you have all those, then you are really geared up as best as possible. So from what I've learned and understand, like you see in the movies a lot, when you're going into a dark scenario, low light, no light conditions, um, you know, you don't go in with your flashlights on all the time. Maybe it makes sense, but when you have all those options, they're just like tools in your tool belt. You're able to use those options when you want, as much as you want, uh, long term or intermittently. So as an example, uh, if you have all that gear that I told you about, if you, it could be a certain scenario where you can just go in and pop the light and leave the white light on and you do what you got to do. But maybe there's other situations where you just go in on, with night vision and your laser and when you need the white light, you're able to pop the white light intermittently instead of le leaving the white light on or a laser, which we can go over uh, in a minute. So going into a room, depending on a scenario, you could, you, again, use that gear intermittently. So for white light, what's pretty cool is it could also be used as an offensive tool where if it's very dark and you have the bad guys there, just popping a white light for a split second could temporarily blind them, and those split seconds gives you a tactical advantage to do what you got to do. Mm -hmm. um, and then as far as a laser, for the, in the most basic way to explain what a laser is or can do, it's an invisible flashlight. So based on the different spectrum of light that lasers work on, uh, as an invisible flashlight, when you have night vision, let's say, let's backtrack. Night vision in a nutshell works where it extracts a minimal amount of light and then amplifies that light millions of times so you can see. So that's why like an alarm clock in a room or, or, or a light from a computer, just a little light is enough for night vision to extract that light and then amplify millions of times to see. But the less light you have or starlight or moonlight outside, but the less light you have, the less you're able to see as well with night vision. So if you're in a complete pitch black cave, Jonathan, night vision yeah. will not work because there's no light to extract and amplify to see. Follow me? Yeah. So that's where a laser comes in because even if it's pitch black, you pop the laser on and now that invisible flashlight lights up. It's like the best case you could see super brightly. It doesn't matter whether it's light or not. And that's why lasers are used for a number of reasons for targeting because you have the dot and it's kind of like a red dot where, you, which we can get into like zeroing your weapon, etc. But anyway, so a, a laser is like an invisible flashlight. So that's why same like using a white light where maybe in certain instances you don't want to leave that white light on for long periods of time. You just want to pop it real quick. Boop. Just because it's with proper training, when you pop the light on real quick, you're able to get an idea of a room and you're able to maneuver in the dark. Um, and then again, like leaving a white light on full time, it gives your position away. Uh, and then, you know, that's not good if there's a bad guy there with a gun. Uh, so using that same principle, that same with a laser, there might be certain scenarios where you don't want to leave the laser on continuously. Well, also the pressure pad, you could pop that laser on when you need it to maneuver from, you know, you know, a, a few steps at a time. Because not likely, but maybe more likely as time goes by, <clears throat> the bad guy may have night vision. I mean, it's not like you need to be law enforcement only to go get night vision, especially in the U.S. Anyone can buy night vision. Uh, even the cheapest ones, the technology is pretty good. 
So if they are using night vision, then my point is they're able to spot that laser. And now the, where the laser, the laser lights coming out, they're able to see that's a laser and then they're going to shoot at that laser. So that's why similarly, like white light, you don't want to necessarily leave that laser on all the time because now you're giving yourself your position away. So basically, right. um, pop the laser and or light, again, it depends, and move, and you do that cat and mouse game. And then also, it's not just night vision, even cell phones, Jonathan, with today's technology yeah. or SLR cameras can spot uh, lasers um, pointing in, in that direction towards you if you had a camera. So just be aware of that. So, I hope so are those uh, infrared lasers, they can spot those too? Well, cameras, uh, cell phones, and certainly night vision can spot IR lasers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, infrared. Or I'll just call it for simplicity's sake, you know, invisible light. That's only a, that cannot be seen by the naked eye, but can be seen by night vision and certain cameras and even cell phones. Yeah. Yeah. So it, uh, I guess it just depends on the situation, but either way, um, yeah, if there's no light, if you're in like a, you know, a basement with no windows and nothing, then, uh, then you have to use your, you know, the, the flash or the laser right. sparingly. Yeah, I see. Um, so would you say that like, um, those are some of the limitations of night vision that like people need to be aware of just, um, when it can give them away. And, and that's kind of, uh, a lot of where the training comes in. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Training. I'm huge on training. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Force on force training, you know, simunition or, or UTM type, you know, in a shoot house all the time, constantly drill, constantly practice with each other. To, to just learn how, you know, to use that, all the, those tools at your disposal, um, for sure. And then also, if I may add, may I jump into thermal? Oh, yeah, for okay. sure. Okay, so the best scenario, but it's cost prohibitive still today, and also bulk-wise or size-wise, best case scenario of all the gear that I told you about is to have fused night vision fuse basically means night vision with thermal together now, now i have a, like a cool video out there of some tactical training i, I did with my telluric group partners like a number of years ago with the u.s marshals uh, shoot house and it's a pretty cool video uh, and uh, that was filmed using uh, envg enhanced night vision goggle which basically had thermal and um, night vision together. So th the best case is having both, but having a monocular that's fused today will run you maybe around fifteen to twenty thousand dollars US each. And then that's just a monocular. So if you wanted a binocular, you know, those could run anywhere from you know like fifty thousand dollars each. So I got some. How many do you want to buy? <laughs> You know, so <laughs> yeah. so so why it's best to have both is this no matter what the condition is, cave like dark scenario, no light <clears throat> or whatever or or not. If you have both the thermal and night vision, it's great because remember, night vision only could extract light and um, allows you to see what you see. And, and, and that means if you just use your eyes with night vision you have to spot or detect something that could be a threat to you. It still requires your eyes. Now with thermal, thermal detects heat. So you could imagine now that you can go into a particular room and yet thermal, you're able to quickly um, detect a heat signature, an individual like the bad guy because of their heat signature. So my point is if you're going into a room and you know it's a room. You gotta you gotta look from left to right or right to left. Uh, you physically, if you're relying just on your eyes with the night vision, you have to be able to scan with your eyes to spot that 
individual who's there with your night vision. But with thermal, when you're going in, boom, you're able to spot. That's a thermal signature. Your eyes go right there. So you're able to now identify uh, because it's that heat signature to quickly spot. And now because of your night vision, now you're able to identify what that thing is. It could be an animal or but more like, let's say, in a room clearing scenario, it's an individual. So, so the point is the thermal allows you to detect uh, an individual quicker where uh, night vision will allow you to identify somebody. But together, it's best. And then if I may also add, without going too far off, when it comes to at least United States law, because I've also worked with uh, surveillance folks, ga gang uh, enforcement, uh, drug enforcement uh, agency, DEA, a lot of those types of people, even U.S. Marshals, they do a lot, gather a lot of intelligence or do a lot of surveillance. So I've been involved with a lot of those, uh, training them and providing gear. And my point on that is that if you want to gather evidence of a bad deed going down at night, thermal <clears throat> will not cut it as far as the laws here to be able to get a search warrant or let's say throw somebody in jail because you know a drug deal is going down uh, because thermal doesn't really identify people as well. So ideally, if you are recording for surveillance purposes, you have to have that night vision element so you could identify that target of that person's face so a judge here in the U.S. could say, yes, okay, he's identified, here's a search warrant, and then you can go legally and, you know, um, enter the, that person's uh, location, home, or whatever. So to wrap up, what I'm trying to say is thermal uh, is not really ideal to identify people, even though you can in some way. Um, it's mostly to detect the heat signature where ideally the night vision could identify somebody's face or identify it's a person or a dog or whatever. Right. Yeah. And just know that there is someone there as opposed to, uh, I guess, even if you're using night vision, if someone's hidden under something, uh, you don't see them move. Right. The thermal uh, fills in that. Um, so is that is that uh, relatively recent that thermal and night vision uh, are combined, you know, in one uh, in one, you know, binocular or monocular? I, I've had those, um, you know, samples uh, in my, you know, uh, office uh, like 15 years ago yeah so so yeah so i mean i would i i don't remember when it came out but i i'd say at least 10 15 years ago fused has been out now but it's just getting better that's pretty I cool see. where where you could also adjust between the night vision and thermal so in other words with the the fuse goggles um whether binocular or monocular you're able to um, turn on the night vision and and then decide how much of the thermal you want to see or not to see. It's pretty cool. Yeah. What are there any other uh, like new advancements in in, uh, in night vision or thermal technology that that kind of have you excited or? There, I would just say what's exciting me is the potential for for digital out there, um, because that means then eventually it'll be a lot smaller. And you're able to record and things of that nature, you know, maybe to your uh, back to headquarters or wherever people monitoring what you're seeing live. Um, we also have the new enhanced night vision goggles that are being fielded today by our, our military, um, where it's pretty cool. It's called the family, like it's a family of night vision type technology, where what when you have your goggles on, long gun that you have has an optic uh, with a laser and all that. And basically what you see, what your rifle sees that's zeroed, you will see that in your goggle. So it's pretty cool. So even you could shoot around a corner with a, with your gun where you can look through the goggle. And as long as, and again, what the, what the gun sees, the optic on the gun sees is what you're able to see in your goggle. So that's rolling out. So that technology is pretty cool. Um, oh, I yeah. see. That sounds like kind of like a Bluetooth or some kind of wireless yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, imaging. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty neat. Right. Yeah. 
And then one more thing I say, you know, you have yeah. those quad type, you see them in the movies, those quad type uh, um, go um, goggles. Instead of binocular, there's four of them, like four different image tubes. You know, that's kind of crazy. Those are very huge, super cost prohibitive. And I've played with those, used them. I mean, you know, they give you even more ability to see more and better and more situational awareness. But the downside is they're just too big and bulky, in my opinion. So I'd say like the perfect balance for me, at least today, is a binocular, at least the night vision. Do you think uh, the average law enforcement agency d does enough uh, low light, uh, no light training um, to, to be prepared for those kind of situations? From my experience, even till just a number of months ago, other than let's just say the handful of major agencies, I would say the vast majority, and again, you know, there's so many different, there's 18,000 law enforcement agencies in the U.S. So let's just say, you know, the big guys, NYPD, LAPD, and, you know, LA Sheriff's Department, etc. those big guys are all geared up and their training is good. But the vast majority, I would say, that do have the gear, if they have it, um, do not train with them enough or effectively or don't have enough of the gear. In other words, they may have night vision, but they don't have laser. And, and, uh, and, uh, so, yes, there's more uh, time and money and training that should go into uh, gearing up uh, more light um, – agencies here in the u.s and i assume in canada too any recommendations you think there's a the type of training and you know where they can receive it or or any kind of other recommendations that if an agency is out there thinking about it well um i mean they could just call me directly and then i could connect them to the right people so um as far as plugging directly a company as far as the tactical training I would, um, and I would never recommend anything or anybody for training unless I've experienced them myself. So I would go with the Telluric group. I'm not saying others aren't good. I haven't experienced them. They could contact me, and I'm happy to vet them. But the Telluric group out of Georgia and, and Florida, and they're the best. They've been doing it the longest. They're awesome, great trainers. They know their stuff. So as far as that training – Absolutely them. And then as far as night vision, uh, you have different different uh, companies like L I don't want to bore the listeners here. There's just a lot a lot of different changes have happened as far as company acquisitions. So the the two primary players today, without going into all the history uh, of night vision today, would be L3 and Elbit. So L3's been around, they offer good night vision, been around for a long time, uh, night vision lasers, and then Elbit, Elbit is new today, and they ended up acquiring Harris Night Vision, which before Harris was Excellus, and before Excellus was ITT. <laughs> Those are the, like the originators of night vision. Uh, so after okay. all these scenarios, let's just say that the U.S. government, the way things were maybe about a year ago, L3 was in a position to consolidate what ITT used to have and what L3 had all along. But the way our government works, they would not allow um, a, a one player having one technology. They wanted to have that split and avoid a monopoly. I'm just using things in a simplistic term. So today, the two major players, as far as night vision in the U.S., is Elbit, again, with the history of uh, Excellus and ITT, and L3. So both are good. I have, um, you know, for me, I, I work with night vision devices, uh, formerly Night Vision Depot. So they're a distributor, and I love what they do. They're a, a big enough company that's been around for decades to do whatever you not need but they're also a small enough company to respond to your needs because a lot of the major players, unfortunately, um, being straight, guys, sorry, but the, their customer service is horrible. You know, <laughs> it, it just takes forever to get something done. Where for And there's other companies too, like Night Vision 
devices or NVD for short, but there's very few, but I work with them. I, I vetted them. They're a good company. And if you call me up and you're uh, an agency and somehow your binocular went down, you know, they'll quickly take care of that versus maybe the, if you deal directly with the big guys or other distributors that I've heard horror stories on, you know, it might take months for you to get anything. Well, we'll, uh, we'll definitely put your, uh, uh, whatever contact info you want up on the, the website. So if people are interested in, uh, in getting a hold of you, uh, for these, uh, recommendations or, or, you know, for training or gear, um, they'll be able to, uh, uh, to reach you. And let me make it clear. Yeah. I, I've been known, I even have testimonials that I only recommend what is best for those people I care and love, our law enforcement and military. That's what I live for. That's what I do. So the reason I'm making that clear is that even if it's a competitor that uh, that would not be financially beneficial to me at that point, I don't care. If it's something that I know is better for them, I send them to competitors too. So that's important. That's good to know. Is there anything uh, anything else you'd like to say about your your training and uh, and and specifically what we've talked about with uh, low light, no light? kind of a general philosophies people should know. As far as the quality of night vision, there's a lot of companies out there who just sell just terrible night vision. Just just be careful. You, you need to get night vision that comes from a reliable source because, you know, people try to save $500 or 1000 and they think, hey, this is $1,000 less. I'm going to buy that. And then in the end, they regret it as a civilian or non-law enforcement or especially law enforcement, don't go with the cheap stuff. There's a reason why um, certain things cost more, because it just requires an, an extraordinary amount of engineering and, and, and product quality to give you that product. And you don't want that cheap gear, especially when you're kicking in the door and your life depends on it. I mean, the, the most basic way to describe it um, as far as night vision or any type of gear, it's like, would you want as a, an operator wearing the, the body armor that uh, had the lowest bid, you know, without really looking at the specs or your child or wife or husband or whatever wearing body armor that basically the lowest bidder. So, so price is important, but you need to look at the specs. Okay. That's my point. And who's behind it? Who stands behind it? Does the company have a history? Etc. Not only just the maker of the product, but also the distributor as well. Because again, sometimes things go down. A monocular, binocular doesn't work. You want to be able to deal with that quickly. So, if an agency is looking to purchase um, some kind of you know night vision technology, and they're and they're looking at what to buy, how long um, would you expect the kind of equipment to last? And and do they have to worry about uh, you know stuff breaking down or warranties? Great question, Jonathan, and very important for law enforcement compared to the, like the military, like I explained, that they spend billions of dollars. If something breaks down, they just go back to the armory and grab something else uh, as, in the military. But law enforcement, they don't have an unlimited budget. So to answer your question, it's not like listed anywhere from any manufacturer, but typically as far as night vision today the analog or image tube technology that is most popular today it'll run about 10,000 hours so you could calculate that depending on how much it can last depending on how often you use it but even though you don't use it there's a certain amount of time as far as just basically wear and tear it just sitting on the shelf uh, over the years so on that note, which is a great question, law enforcement agencies should be very aware of the warranty and the company that backs up that warranty of the particular night vision. So typically some night vision, you know, the, or, or lasers for that matter, the warranty could be anywhere from one to two years. So if you think about it, you spend a thousand or a number of thousands of dollars on something and then after two years it goes down, you know, you got a problem because now the warranty, you're out of luck. You have to buy new night vision or you have to spend, who knows, 500, 1,000 or a couple of thousand to fix that night vision. So typically, to wrap up on that question, 
most night vision would have a three and five year warranty. So don't ask me why it's like this, but anyway, typically they will end up telling you that on the night vision device, the housing, the, 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 the system will end up being a three year warranty and the image tube typically five years. So in other words, if the eyepiece due to normal wear and tear breaks off or something cracks on the night vision device, uh, within three years, then the warranty will cover that. But after that, you know, maybe a battery housing or a crack could end up costing you $500 or $1,000 to fix. And then as far as the image tube, it's up to five years typically, where if the image tube goes out through normal wear and tear, then they will replace that image tube. And an image tube, uh, if it goes out, we're talking around a couple thousand dollars or more. So you can see how expensive that can be. So there are some companies um, that, you know, that I work with that have a 10-year warranty. So a warranty you have to include in your consideration and price as far as buying something. And if you can imagine a 10-year warranty, that's amazing. 10 years, uh, I would strongly recommend trying to get something with the longest warranty. It's uh, an important thing to consider, I guess, uh, for any agency, especially a small one. Even LAPD, where you know we're neighbors and we worked together in the past, you know, if one of those things goes down, it's not like you got ten of them on the shelf to grab and use again. You're, you're stuck. One of your operators is out of that night vision uh, device. So, so, so the point is, it's more than just price. Get quality and make sure you work with a company that could handle the customer service after the sale is done. The sale doesn't end at the time you get the gear and you pay for the product. The, the, the sale is ongoing, a relationship. Um, all right, then one more thing, if I may add, ITAR, as yep. far as US, U.S. law, International Trafficking Arms Regulations. Just out there to all my buddies, whether you're former law enforcement, military, or, or in uh, wearing uniform, remember as far as U.S. laws, there's a, a extreme um, regulation called ITAR, International Traffic and Arms Regulations, that, that uh, relates to night vision because it's part of military technology. So I, as a... You know, I'm no longer uh, in the military. I'm not law enforcement. I could go buy night vision on my own. And then if I wanted to go on a family camping trip to go up north to Canada, I mean, California, or just to go south to Mexico and just kind of bring my night vision device just to go look at the birds and, you know, look at wildlife at night and they catch me, you are screwed because that's a felony. So you, you got to be aware that you need to get an export license. That's my point. In right. order to be able to take any night vision out of the country or sell it out of the country because it's extremely regulated. So Similar to like a, a weapon, right? Well, certain weapons, uh, uh, certain weaponry. It's just like a high tech uh, regulated type um technology i see that's very good uh, for people to know i'm sure yeah so just to wrap up i mean i'm here for people i'm here to direct uh advise uh, let me know whether it's combatives training um low light no light training night vision even you know financial part being a prominent businessman you know, as crazy as this sounds, I've been involved with helping people protect their money and families. That's been a natural transition. So whatever, uh, my number, you know, it's available for people to call me. Well, thank you so much for uh, for coming on the program. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll throw the whatever info you want up on our site so uh, so people can get at you if they're if they're looking for that kind of uh, assistance. So. Thanks again, Spiro, for uh, coming on. Thank you, Jonathan, for having me and for everyone listening. I hope uh, what I provided is helpful for to you. Have a wonderful, blessed day, everyone. Thank you. This has been the Prepared Warrior Podcast. For more info on our guests or other episodes, check out theprepareworrior.com. 
If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for the Prepared Warrior podcast, email J-O-N at theprepared warrior.com.